Good morning, Christ Church. Good morning. We welcome you here today at, at the, um, here at Christ Church in uh, Southern Maryland. And the scripture tells us in 1 John 3, 1, See how the love of the Father has bestowed upon us that we would be called the children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it does not know him. Let us stand for the pledges of the flag. The pledge of the American flag. We pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, individual, and liberty and justice for all. The Christian flag. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior to whom the kingdom it stands, one Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty for all who believe. And to God's word, the Bible, I pledge the word, allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. His words will hide in my heart that I might not sin against me. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful day, this glorious day. We ask that you bless our service. We ask that you bless uh, Rusty and his family this morning and that you help him with his uh, message that he's going to give to us, Lord. We know that he's going to tell us about your word and your wonderful story and your, uh, your gift to us through Jesus Christ on the cross for our salvation. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to sing a song called You Are Holy. <laughs> One, two, three, four.
Still looking for my basket, Lynn, but this will work for now. <laughs> This is my all-time favorite gospel song. Because I know what this happy day was. For whoever wrote this song, I know exactly what they were saying. Jesus washed. When Jesus washed, He washed my 
sins away. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. He taught me how. When Jesus walked, oh, when He washed, when my Jesus washed, He washed my sins away. Oh, happy day! He taught me. Phyllis is playing so hard on that one, she broke a nail. Please be seated. Of the strong, from the lips 
lips of all people. This song we raise, Lord, throughout the endless ages, you will be crowned with praises, Lord, most high, exalted in Today we have a special privilege of having a representative from the Mission Explosion International. Today, through the grace of God, we have the privilege of having the great man of God to speak with us. He has gathered many, he has gathered many harvesters for the kingdom of heaven through his mission work, particularly in the India area. He is also a great husband, father, grandfather, as well as our friend. Please welcome Brother Rusty Swafford. Thank you, brother. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to sit down on the job today. Y'all don't mind. <clears throat> good morning, good morning, good morning. It's the Lord's Day, and uh, it's good to be back among people. I tell you, this uh, China plague has uh, taken havoc on uh, a lot of folks, especially <clears throat> our brothers and sisters in India. Um, I was, uh, I've been able to send, uh, you folks have given uh, to this also, and, and I want to say thank you, but we've, we've been able to send uh, around six thousand, a little over six thousand uh, dollars, over the course of this uh, this plague, uh, to help our brothers and sisters in Christ in India. They also have been in lockdown, and the healthcare systems there are nothing compared to what we have here in America, and um, the livelihood. Uh, of some of these folks, uh, I think the government may have given one round of, of help to these people, um, and it was uh, some rice, and the reports that I got back was that the rice that they were given by the government of India to help them during this uh, pandemic was that uh, it was stockpiled, like, uh, like I saw actually coming down uh, the interstates where they put the sand in these big bins, you know, to put out when it snows. <laughs> well, rats and all kinds of things crawling through all that rice and um, just the, the, the sun and all of the elements and everything. Just, uh, uh, can you imagine eating that? I mean, seriously. And um, I had... Uh, a little lady, an uh, Indian lady, come up to one of our preachers uh, to say thank you. And she was rubbing her stomach and she was telling them, said, uh, thank you for giving us uh, the puni rice. And uh, I didn't know what puni rice was, but 
the, uh, the preacher in India told me that puni rice is the rice that, that's eat, eaten by uh, wealthy folks. And um, so the preachers asked me, what kind of rice do you want us to buy? I said, well, I want you to buy better than what the government's given out for sure. And uh, I said, you, you, you buy the rice that, uh, that the people eat that, that's good for them. And so she was in tears, and she said the government rice hurt her stomach, but, but our rice was, uh, was giving them, uh, you know, health. We've, we've handed out literally thousands of bags of rice. These people were in um, ration of one meal a day, and it consisted of basically some uh, small amounts of rice and, and uh, maybe a few vegetables. Uh, made into what they call a sambar, like a, a soup, and they would mix it with the rice. So I want to say thank you because uh, we've been able to help our brothers and sisters in, in the churches um, tremendously. And uh, uh, one of our preachers messaged me the other day and said, Brother Rusty, if you come to India, you know uh, that you can run for our political office and everybody will vote for you because uh, they, they're so thankful I said, no, 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 I'm not, I don't want any uh, of the praise or anything like that, but they, they, they're so happy, um, and I, I really appreciate all the, uh, the help you guys have given to, to our ministry. Um, I want to talk to you th- this morning about evangelism, but I want to start by saying that five years ago today, my granddaughter over there, stand up, Kylie, so everybody can see you. My granddaughter was baptized into Christ. And um, she, she was six years old. And this has to do with evangelism because I want to share with you the simplicity of evangelism and how our Lord made it so simple. She was six years old. We had made our first trip to Israel. And we got those tickets, <laughs> it's amazing, we bought those tickets because we flew from Florida to Atlanta and then from Atlanta to Knoxville, but we got a layover uh, in, um, in Atlanta and they had overcrowded the planes, this has been, you know, five years ago, so, but they, the, the lady at the counter said, uh, we, um, we, we have $1,100 for, the, for five people, if you'll bump this flight and take the next one. And, I mean, we immediately jumped up there to the counter. Hey, we got five of us. Let's do it, you know, right now. And I want you to know we got 1100 bucks each. The first time in my life that's ever happened. and Probably will never happen again. But we sat down as a family, uh, Joey and Jordan and Kylie and Audrey and I, and we decided if we could go anywhere in the world, where would we want to go? And uh, it wasn't Hawaii or the Bahamas or whatever. And we decided to go to Israel. And so we, we had our tickets basically paid for. And we, we, we went to so many of the sites. If you've never had a chance to go to Israel, you definitely need to go. I've been back uh, several times since then. But... Um, we went to what they call the baptismal site uh, of Jesus. Now, I personally don't think that's where it was, but, you know, for the sake of it, that's where everybody goes and gets baptized. And I've seen people do some really crazy things there over the years where they take uh, the, the Jordan River water and they'll sprinkle it on their Bible as to maybe make it more holy. I'm not sure what the purpose of that is, but, but anyway... There's a lot of crazy things these people do at this baptismal site. Uh, literally hundreds of people come to be baptized. I've, I've seen them walk out in the water, uh, chest deep, and then the, the, the preacher or whatever takes his hand and pours it over their head. And I'm thinking, what's wrong with that picture? But, but anyway, so we got there that day late. We were traveling some other places. And we pulled into the site. There was not a car in the parking lot. Nobody was there. It was literally closed, empty. Nobody was there. It was getting close to dark. We had about an hour left of daylight, I guess. 
And we, we wanted to see other things, so I said, let's, let's go down and take a look at the baptismal site. And so I thought, I, I want to get in this thing. You know, we were, we, every place we stopped, we read scripture that had to do with, with what happened there. Uh, you know, the, the story of Naaman and, and the dipping seven times, and then, of course, Jesus and John and all of that. So I, I waited out in there, and I was kind of cutting up a little bit. I was thinking, well, I was going to dip seven times, see what happens. You know, you never know. I mean, you know, see what happens. But it didn't work. Obviously, my knees are still bad. But, but anyway, <laughs> so I was out there in this Jordan River. And by the way, these little fish that people pay big money for to go and eat the flesh off of your, your feet in places, they're, they're there and they'll take care of business for you. Uh, I mean, they just got the creepiest thing in the world to have this thousand little fish biting flesh off your feet. But anyway, or the, the, dark, the dead skin, they're not piranhas, but you know what I'm saying. But, but anyway, so I was out there and we, we weren't thinking much about baptism or anything, but I was walking up the steps and Kylie, my granddaughter, came down and she said, uh, uh, Poppy, can I, can I be baptized? And um, at first, I mean, she was six years old, so I wasn't really thinking about that this baptismal experience. She, she didn't know a whole lot about the Jordan River and all of that. And I, I, said, I said, why? She said, because I want to uh, have my sins forgiven. I want to go to heaven. And as a grandfather, I'm excited to death about that. But, but also, I, I passed the buck back to Jordan and Joy, her mom and dad. I said, you, you need to go talk to them about this. I, I don't know, you know, because I'm always worried about age and knowledge and, and all of that. I'm never sure about all of that. I know that both my children, uh, Justin and, and Jordan, both were baptized young because they were around the teaching and the preaching of salvation for their entire life from the time they came out of the womb. So I understood that, and so had Kylie. So she went and talked to her mom and dad, and guess what? Their mom and dad passed the buck back to me. <laughs> so me and Kylie, we sit down, and I really, to be honest with you, have never had anybody, especially a child, tell me what the purpose of being immersed into Christ was all about as a six-year-old at that time. And I looked up at her mom and dad and I said, you know, she's ready. And why, why not? So Joy and I took her out and, and we baptized her in the Jordan River. And I, I uh, the thing popped up on my, uh, my Facebook thing, uh, a memory. And uh, it's hard to imagine. Five years later, this little girl's been, I don't know how many places overseas, and has been uh, really the, the poster child for evangelism in many of these countries, uh, helping, reaching out, uh, sharing, loving on our children's home, kids, and, and so many things. And I want to talk about evangelism this morning because I call it Evangelism 101, and throughout this whole message, I want you to remember the word simple. I, I tell you, it is simple. And it is so simple that a child, a six-year-old, can understand what the purpose is. So I want to ask you this morning, why are you here? And I, and I don't mean in this building. I mean on this earth. You see, in the beginning... God said to Adam and Eve, I want you to replenish the earth. And then through Noah and his family, the same word was given to replenish the earth. We, we read in Scripture that God is a jealous God. We know that our, our purpose as a human being, when, when we come out of the womb, and so many never had that chance, unfortunately, in, in this world. 
through abortion. But when we come out of the womb, we come out with a purpose in life. And that purpose in life is not getting an education, getting married, having children, having a good job of making something of yourself in your life. That purpose is for worship. You see, God created us to worship Him. But unfortunately, we're told in Scripture that many, which actually means every, one is called, but few are chosen. We're told in Scripture that many will go down the wide road that leads to destruction, but only a few will go down the narrow road that leads to eternal life. We, we know that Jesus warned us and told us this is what's going to happen with multitudes, with the replenishing of the earth, that there will be scores and scores and scores of people who will not worship who will not obey, who will not conform to the wishes of God to worship Him. He created us, which is called a testing pad, earth. <laughs> we're, we're in a testing pad. You see, God is a God who looked beyond the creation of this earth. Matter of fact, he looked beyond it because he understand that one day he's going to destroy it. So if this was going to be home, he would have thought about that, but he decided, no, no this is not home. This is a testing ground. And that's what it's going to be with your life. And I do mean a short life. I turned 60 years old a month ago. And I don't know what happened to the years. I can't even find, I don't know what happened. I, I woke up one morning and I looked back and I can't even remember hardly my childhood. It just, shoom, gone. Life is short. We're told in Scripture that it's like a, a vapor and it just vanishes. It's amazing. And the older you get, those of you who are older than me for sure can, can test to this, is your mind begins to focus more on what's coming than what's been. And what's coming, according to God and His Word, is His purpose, which was eternal life. And I'm hanging on to that one really, really strong right now. My mom just turned 84 years old. Faithful as the day is long to the Lord and the church. And she talks all the time about when she's going to be able to be in eternity. I, I tell you folks, we've got to get our mind set on the purpose of our life and not get caught up in the things. We, we want to get caught up. There, there's the scripture in Thessalonians that uses that word caught up. That, that's when we, we take off like a rocket. Uh, and, and meet the Lord in the air. That, that's what that means, like a rocket. We're, take, we're caught up. And we, but, but we get caught up with this world, with this earth, with this life that's around us. And the next thing we know, the next thing we know, we hear the C word, cancer. We, 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 we have tragedy happen. And when we thought we were going to live forever, the next thing happens is we know we're not. And young people especially, you need to take note of this. We were in Philadelphia the other day. There was a, a guy on a bicycle who went in front of a car. We were at a red light. There was one car in front of us, and the light, he, he started going across, and there was a guy in a pickup truck, literally the light turned green just as he started 
going across the, the intersection, and a guy in a, in a white pickup truck was barely, because he, he could see the green light way back, so he was pushing the gas. And I saw the guy in front of the vehicle, in front of us on the bicycle, and my mind, I saw that this truck was going to just nail him. And I don't know how he survived. The guy slammed his brakes on, and he went into the side, the, the bicycle guy, into the side of the wall. And I'm looking back in my rearview mirror, and he's, like, terrified, and he's shaking his head like, wow, what an experience I just had. And, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, you know, dude, that could have been your last breath you breathed on this earth. What is your relationship with the Lord? What are you thinking right now? So folks, we've got to begin to focus on our purpose. So I want to give you four things to think about. One is the message, one is the messenger, and one is the method, and the other is the motivation for evangelism. And I want to start in Ephesians. I want to share with you in Ephesians chapter 4. I'm just going to read a little bit of this. When you go home, you need to read Ephesians 4 and 5. It's just amazing stuff in here. But it, it says in, in, um, in verse 9, um, it says that he ascended, and what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended himself also, he who ascended far above the heavens so that he might uh, feel all things. So Jesus on the cross went from the cross down to the lower parts. He made the proclamation. He didn't preach a salvation message to those people. He proclaimed him to be Messiah and the scripture says that he took paradise to heaven with him. So then he ascended to heaven, as we know, on the right hand of God. But before he left, it says this. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Now I take this, by the way, this is all in the, in the male gender in the Greek. I take this pastors and teachers as those who are elders and those who are teaching and preaching elders as the scripture uh, uh, relates to them uh, in, in the other places in the Bible. So he gave that, but he gave it for the equipping of the saints for the works of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result of this, we will no longer be children tossed here and there by every wave, carried by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in all aspects unto him who is the head even Christ. This goes on to say, Paul wrote this letter to the church at Ephesus. If you go over to the rest of chapter 4 and 5, you're going to see some pretty nasty, nasty stuff these guys were doing. And unfortunately, that's us. We're, we're, he's talking to us. We, we also have done some pretty nasty stuff. And he says that we shouldn't live like that any longer, like the Gentiles. He says we need to get back to being our purpose in life. So some people read this Ephesian letter to talk about filling the church building full of people or that the church people are to love one another and just and, and, and mature and grow. And, and that's true. But the question is, is, is how is that possible? What, what, what actually happens in this whole process known as the church? See, if you look at the church in Revelation, the church of Laodicea, you're going to find a church 
that wasn't a church. Now, I know it's called the church, but how can you possibly be a church when Christ is not invited in? How can you possibly be a church when you're so arrogant to think that you are perfect and you are in need of nothing? But Jesus said, you are poor, pitiful, and blind, and I'm on the outside, and if you want me on the inside, I'm knocking, but you need to open the door and invite me in for fellowship, for that meal, that fellowship meal. So this was a church that wasn't a church, and I'm, I'm sad to say, folks, that today we have a lot of Laodicean churches throughout the world. Now, let's look at the message. John 3.16, I tell you, everybody in the world, from Hindus and Muslims and Buddhists and everybody, I mean, this is the fam most famous verse in the world. I've asked Hindus, do you know John 3.16? Well, yeah, they do because they see the signs here and everywhere. And, you know, I mean, it's even in the ball games, you know, in the back, you know, when the field goal goes up, John 3.16 used to. I don't know if they still do that or not. But, you know, we hadn't had sports in so long. I forgot about all that. But anyway, for God so loved the world. How simple is that? Simple. For God so loved the world that he sent Jesus to save the world. That, that's, that's pretty simple. I mean, that's, that's, anybody can understand that. For God loved the world. Why, why, so, so what's the problem? We know the problem is sin. We know we're a separation from God. And we know to fix that problem, that separation from God, because sin separates us from God, Jesus came. And as God looks at us, he looks at us through the, you know, they used to call them rose-colored glasses. Remember that song? Uh, in the blood-colored glasses is what he looks through of Jesus Christ. He sees the blood. And then he sees us as saints. That's how we're called saints. Not because of who we are, but because of what Jesus did for us. So in Acts chapter 2, what, 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 before we get to Acts chapter 2, Jesus told us on several occasions, he said that, that to go into all the world and to preach the good news, to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teach the people to observe all the things I've commanded, and I will be with you to the very end of the age. We have so many times where Jesus talked about being baptized. He, he told... Uh, um, uh, Nicodemus, unless he's born of the water and of the Spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. And literally, in, in, in chapter 4, you're, you're seeing John people and Jesus people baptizing folks. So, this message is very simple. In Acts chapter 2, you know, verse 38, the, the message is so simple a six-year-old can understand it. So repent and be baptized, immersed into Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And folks, I think sometimes we neglect talking about the Holy Spirit when we are talking about salvation. We, we talk about repentance, we talk about baptism, but we don't talk about the benefit, which is an eternal benefit of the, of the Holy Spirit. Let me, let me explain. The Scripture says without the Holy Spirit, we can't enter into the kingdom. We, we have to have the Holy Spirit. All kinds of arguments going on in this day and age of how you get it, but the Scripture is so plain as to when the Holy Spirit comes. After you repent, after you're immersed into Christ, the gift of the Holy Spirit is given to us. And the Scripture teaches us that it's a guaranteed deposit for the time when our soul leaves this body and is carried into the presence of God. And then while we're here on earth, the Holy Spirit not only is our counselor and our comforter, but he also is our director. And we don't talk about that. 
Do you realize that the Holy Spirit directs you and leads you to people who need to hear the gospel? Just like Philip was sent to the eunuch by the Holy Spirit, we also are moved around. I, I like to look at it like this. We're pawns on the chessboard of life, and when we're not quenching the Holy Spirit, we're allowing God to use us and move us to get checkmate. And that's what the outcome should be, a checkmate. A checkmate means another soul brought to Christ. That's what it is. That's the message. For God so loved the world. And then the messenger. That's us. You know, in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, it talks about us being jars of clay or earthen vessels. And in this jar of clay that we've been made from dirt, and that's just a weird thing to think about really, isn't it? Especially in this day of all this racial stuff and skin color and all of this stuff. What we, none, none of us are just dirt. Have you ever looked at some clay pots? I mean, some of them are lighter, some of them are darker, some of them are medium, some of them are this, some of them, you know. But, but the bottom line is it's just, just dirt. It's clay. And it's been crafted and put together by God. He's the potter, we're the clay. And you know, sometimes these pots get cracked, and they get chipped, they get broken. And the wonderful thing about it, the potter, he can take that and he can repair it, he can fix it, and he can make it look just as good as new. And that's what our Lord does for us. He picks us up off the dirt and he wipes us off and he sends us back on when we repent and we get up from our sins and we go on forward to the purpose of our life. But I want to tell you something. An earthen vessel is just a common everyday household object. Nothing fancy about it. In India, they're in every home. You know, the Bible says in Isaiah that Jesus didn't look like Rocky or, you know, some of these other Hollywood actors. I saw a statue in Philadelphia that I guess that's probably why that came out, that rocky thing, you know. But but anyway, so it says that he didn't have any stat stature, any 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 facial features that would attract us to him. In other words, he looked like us. I think none of us in here really hot, you know, either. But but the point is, we're just common people. We're an earthen vessel, but we carry a powerful message, the message of the gospel. And in India, I had to fire a preacher. I don't like doing that. I, I really, I had to dismiss him for our ministry. Why? Because he insisted on wearing one of them stupid priest collars. And I kept asking him, what in the world do you want to do that for? Do you not understand that you're putting the focus on you and taking it away from Christ? I, I, you know, Jesus was a high priest. The Bible says in the, in the order of Melchizedek. So he, he, if anybody, could have wore priestly garments, but he did not do that. He wore common clothes of a common man, and remember what they said about the apostles? They're just ordinary Galileans. But what a message that's coming out of their mouth about Jesus. Silver and gold I don't have. But what I do have is from Christ. You know, every bag of rice, every bag of vegetables, every bag of lentil that's given out in India is given out in the name of Jesus, followed by a salvation message of Christ so that all can hear and they know exactly where this is coming from. 
It didn't come from Rusty. It didn't come from Ides. It didn't come from Christ Church. The money obviously came. But all of us, we are represented. We're ambassadors for Christ. That's what we are. You know, the method. The method. I, I did an internship years ago when I was in college at Johnson Bible College University now. I went to, um, to Chapel Rock Christian Church in Indianapolis. Back in them days, that was a big church. I don't know about it today, but, but they had a, a logo, you know, like y'all says, love, love Christ, love, love one another, love, love others. But their, their logo was stay anchored to the, or so no, stay geared to the times, but anchored to the rock. I like that. That's pretty cool. You know, method, there's lots of methods. I, I can tell you this. We have a church in India today because of children's tying all. See, we were, we were going through a village when, when my kids were young, and Audrey always carried children's tie all because Justin Jordan always had some kind of little fever or something because they were always drinking something. They ought to be drinking nasty water or, or eating something that's got junk all over it and just making them sick. So she carried these children's tie all. So we were going through the village. We, we didn't have a church there. We wanted to plant a church. And so people were rejecting us. Matter of fact, some people were asking us to leave. And um, um, we were getting ready to go, actually. And we, what we would do, we would go and we'd ask people we could pray for them. So we stopped at this little hut, and this lady come out with this baby, burning up with fever. And, um, and I laid hands and healed. No, no, I'm done. That's, that's, that's for a Benny, Benny Hinn sermon. But, but anyway, no, we, we, this lady, you could see in her face that, that she was panicking because her child was burning up with fever. And... Audrey said, you know, I've got some children's tie I'll say, look, good, let's give it to her. And so we gave that baby that tie all and we went on around the village, and as we started to come back, we had no results, no luck. I, I mean, just we prayed before we went in, and I'm thinking, well, I, I don't know what the problem is. We, we're, we're getting nowhere here in this village. So we come out, and here comes the husband and the wife, and they're smiling, and it's amazing what about 30 or 40 minutes that it will do with children's Tylenol uh, to a fever and knock it right out. And the baby was feeling better. And next thing I know, because of children's Tylenol and the Lord, we went inside that hut and we started talking to them about Jesus. And they invited us back for a Bible study. And they were our first baptized converts in that village. And today we've got about 150 people that go uh, to uh, worship in that place. It's amazing. The method. The, the, the method. There, there's lots of methods. But I want you to, I, I'm not, I don't have time this morning because I get carried away and talking too much, but I want you to write these down. And I want you to go back and, and listen to or read these scriptures. Um, because I want you to see, starting from Acts chapter 41, where 3,000 souls were brought to Christ on the day of Pentecost. I want you to see the progression of how the church grew. And the method was simple back then. Remember that? I told you remember that word simple. It was very simple. Simple. Repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit. And so Acts 2.41, Acts 2.47, Acts 4.4, 4, Acts 5.14, Acts 6.7, Acts 8.4, Acts 9.31, Acts 11.21, and Acts 11.24. Every one of these verses shows more 
and more and more and thousands and thousands, and I do mean thousands, I'm not exaggerating. I know I'm a preacher, and preachers exaggerate a lot, but I'm not exaggerating now. Thousands and thousands and thousands of souls as you go through the book of Acts, the history of the church, coming to Jesus Christ. It's amazing if you look at these scriptures and just follow and see what happens. It's really amazing. Priest coming to the Lord, it, it's just amazing. Multitudes, multitudes coming to Jesus. My question is, is what happened? Well, we lost the method, the simple method. We don't talk about Jesus anymore. We talk about a lot of things. And I know it's difficult, folks. I know it is. Because it's just not a popular thing to do much anymore. But that's your purpose. Your, your purpose is to do that. Now, the last thing I want to talk about this morning is the motivation. I used to tell our preachers years ago, are you more interested in ministry or are you more interested in money? Because back when I first started going, some of these American missionaries were paying salaries to these Indian preachers based on how many baptisms they had. And some of them were baptizing their cousins and their uncles and their aunts and their the grandmas and, you know, two and three and four. They, they, they were waterlogged. They were baptized so much to get a salary. And I told them what Paul did. I didn't come to baptize. I, I'm not interested in how many baptisms you have. I'm interested in how many people you talk to about Jesus. You see, folks, we are not responsible for the result. We're not. But we are responsible for the message. We are responsible for sharing that message. Now, whether somebody says yes or no, that's not our control. We can't do anything about that. We can do all we can do, but we are responsible for the message. You remember the, the game we played as kids, hide and go seek? I, I love that game. Sometimes I still play it with my with my granddaughters, and and you know, and I, I can't hide much anymore because I'm you know big as a house, and so it don't work really good. But sometimes I'll I'll put some cover over me or something, or I'll make it look like I'm laying in the bed, you know, and then I'll go hide, you know, in the bathroom somewhere or whatever. But but it's hide and go seek. Now we understand the word hide. But what about the word seek? That's an interesting word, a biblical word, by the way. The word seek is, <coughs> it's a word <laughs> that Jesus used. And let me share what he said. I have come to seek and save the lost. <coughs> now, Ephesians 4 says, that we're supposed to be imitating Christ in the church. Our motive has to be pure. Our motive for evangelism has to be the same motive of Jesus. So Jesus, why did you come to seek and to save the lost? That should be our motive, nothing else. It's a simple motive to seek. Seek, my brothers and sisters, means to go out and look. It doesn't mean to come in here and hide. It doesn't mean that. It means that in your daily life, in your purpose of life, you are to be seeking opportunity to save the lost. I've had the honor and the privilege 
of baptizing hundreds of people, I can say, in my lifetime. Some of those people that I have baptized into Christ are now in heaven. I remember baptizing a little old lady in India. I was doing a, a, a meeting, and she was humped over. She had severe arthritis, and she, she couldn't sit up straight. And her, 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 um, her mother brought her to the meeting, and she came forward, and she gave her life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we baptized her. And for years, I would go back and watch her in the church. And I, I, I tell you something, some of the sweetest memories of this dear saint was when I would watch her get up, and they have a little offering box that sit in front of the pulpit to get up and watch her bring her, her money. You might think, what the, what, what's so, that's so special, Rusty. Well, I'll tell you, because when that little saint was putting that money in, I knew, uh, I thought back to the widow's might and who gave everything she had to, to her God. I was in the, the States, and I got word that she, she went home to be with God. If there's any woman that I would have flew back to India to do her funeral, it would have been that dear sister. I, I think a lot about her and, and her hardship and her pain that she went through here on this earth. And now I think about how she's pain free, how, how it must be for her. You know, I love that song, I Can Only Imagine. I love it. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Love the movie, love everything about it. It's just fantastic. I can only imagine what she's seen now and how her life is. But also I can only imagine what if the Holy Spirit hadn't prompted her daughter to bring her. What if the Holy Spirit hadn't brought me at that point in time to share the salvation message of Jesus, where would she be today? So folks, don't let your loved ones, don't let people go by without sharing this message. Let your motivation be pure, and trust me, if it is, the people you're talking to, and they may not like it, they may reject it. They may not even like what you're saying. But they will know from your heart that you love them and you care about their life and their soul, and that's why you're doing it. My grandfather, and I'll close with this, my mom's dad, years ago when I was in Bible college, he was dying with uh, cancer, and I went to his house, and he was sitting out on the front porch in the chair, and I called him Papa. I went up to him. I said, Papa, can I talk to you about Jesus? No, I don't want to hear it. I said, Papa, I I'm going to talk to you about Jesus today. I've got to do it. You know, I was just dumb enough not to know the difference back in those days. And I started talking to him, and he was getting madder and madder by the second. Matter of fact, he got so mad at me, he raised his hand to hit me. I didn't know my mama was listening to everything that was being said at the kitchen window there at the sink where it was raised. She yelled to the top of her lungs out that window. His name was Barney. Said, Barney, don't you hit that boy. He's trying to help you save your soul. You listen to him. I got up. I was crying. Went in and told my mama all goodbye. Went back to college that Sunday afternoon. And I got word that my grandfather died of a heart attack that week. I don't know. 
See, I'm not in the business of putting people in hell or out of hell or in heaven or out of hell. I'm just in the business of sharing the message of Christ. God is our judge. And I'm so glad he is. And I'm so glad he's merciful and forgiving, long-suffering. I'm, I'm so glad all those things about God. Today, I'm closing with this message of salvation. Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your precious word, for your direction in our life as we try to do what you want us to do, Lord. Father, we live in a world today... I know it must have been hard back in those days, but it just seems, Lord, that every angle, every place we turn is full of, of, of sin and immorality and bad things and anger and hatred and just so many things that Satan has confused the minds of people, deprived minds, so many things, God. It's so hard to live on this earth. And we know you know that, but we also know that your word never changes. Your message never changes. And your motivation to seek and to save the lost never changed either. Let us be those kinds of people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Rusty.
On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross The emblem of suffering and shame And I love that old cross Where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down
How many of you have heard the phrase, the clothes makes the man? When you think of celebrities, people in power, kings and queens, you have this image that usually comes to mind of someone who's sharply dressed and with that commands some respect. Another phrase that we also like to use is everyone is wearing their Sunday best or their Sunday clothes. And once again, what does that mean? It, it means that you have the best clothes on that you own or that you're dressed the best that you can. Now the question I want to ask you guys today is what are you wearing? We're going to read from Isaiah chapter 61. Verse 10 says, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord, for my soul will exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, as, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. So when I ask you today, what are you wearing? You might say, oh, I have on Ralph Lauren. I might have on, you know... Prada or Gucci. But really, the question is, what is the dress code that we need for heaven? And what Isaiah has told us is that we have this robe of righteousness. It's really the only clothes that matter. We don't have really a dress code for church where you're going to be barred from coming in if you're not wearing a suit or a tie or a dress. Because really, the only thing that matters is your spiritual garments. Do you have your robes on today? When we think of communion, it's a reminder. Jesus enacted it, and he told us to do it as a remembrance. But what he's also reminding us through communion is that we have our salvation from him and that these robes came at a price. We didn't earn these robes. We didn't work hard enough. We didn't, you know, we didn't deserve anything other than the punishment that we're avoiding. But we were given this gift. And this gift came at a cost. These robes were not free. And what that cost was, was the sacrifice that Jesus had to make. It was the spilling of innocent blood to take our place. The price of those robes was the body of Jesus that was broken and the blood that was poured out. And this communion is a reminder of that. So today, when we're thinking about it as, as we're eating the bread and as we're drinking the juice, don't only think about the price, but what it gave us. It gave us an opportunity of salvation. It gave us a chance to be with him. He wrapped us in this robe of righteousness. He clothed us with garments of salvation. And it came at because he loved us. And he wanted us to have a chance to be with him. So as we take this cup and this bread, let's remember that today. When the disciples, disciples and Jesus were in the upper room and they were celebrating the Passover meal, they had bread and wine. And from that, we have our communion today. We have a representation of the blood and the body of Jesus. At this time, let's take the bread and remember Jesus' body. And after they broke bread and gave thanks and ate it, they had wine or juice. And this represents Jesus' blood that was poured out for us. At this time, let's take and drink the juice.
Precious Lord Jesus, we want to thank for, give thanks for Rusty and his wife, Audrey, for the mission work, for they were not ashamed to get their feet wet for the Lord. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you for your encouragement and hope today that you have presented to us whereby we can see your hands at work in this world. Allow us to take your holy word <clears throat> and project it to others. We ask that you touch our hearts so that we can visualize and recognize that all of us are missionaries for you and that those who are our enemies are indeed our mission field. Yes, Abba Father, as your rain cleanses and purifies and refreshes the air all around us, allow the love of Jesus to radiate and purify those who do not know the Christ of God. Let Christ be honored and glorified in all that we say and do, now and always. It's in the name of our prophet, priest, and king, Christ Jesus, that we pray, asking and giving thanks for all things. Amen.